everyone, welcome to the Isris video blog number three, or vlog three. Um, first of all, just a bit on the band um, progress, what we've been up to recently. Brown's still in Rome, he'll be back in I don't know, a few days I think. Um, but Tom and I have been working on our stuff, we've, we've been uh, getting mixes together of what we, what we have recorded so far. Um, which is all sounding really, really cool. Just so we've got mixes that we can show to um, the guy who's mixing it to give him specific information like reverbs, delays, or specific effects we want at points, where we want certain fade outs or fade in, stuff like that. Um, a few sort of, especially in the guitar, there's some delays that are kind of critical that they were written with but not, not recorded with because you add them in the mixing phase. Um, other than that, I've been working on sort of additional guitars using uh, MIDI and VG systems which is something we're actually going to spend some time discussing today to kind of dispel some myths that have been uh, brought to our attention uh, over the years. Lots of people sort of misunderstand um, what, what these kind of systems are and why we use them and etc. Mm. <coughs> so yeah, anything else you want to add? Uh, just I uh, guess a little um, my take on the mix down on everything you said really um, so basically you know we we were last week uh, doing some rough mix downs of the tracks um, just so that we could hear what was going on and since then we've been reviewing them and we've made notes haven't we about certain things that need to change uh, over the next month obviously we're sending all of the audio over to Daniel Bergstrand um, who will be mixing the album at the end of January. So we've got we've January... Got a deadline. Yeah, we've got a deadline um, that's not self-imposed. Uh, mm. So um, also, you know, I was working on a rough mix of, of one of our tracks just to see what, what we ended up with, if we actually went through more or less the full process of mixing things. We were almost in that, the position to be able to do that. And uh, it was a really interesting process for me a little bit time consuming but I really learned uh, a lot that really kind of showed me what was you know what needed to be done in terms of the routing of the mics and the drum kit and how it's best to actually set everything up so that it can be mixed properly by by Daniel in a you know more efficient way um, and also just a note on that uh, you know basically we confirmed again that uh, we've definitely made the right choice for going with Daniel yeah. by a being our mix you know uh, against work that he's done and other bands have done and yeah we reconfirm the fact that, that yeah, um, it's definitely the right move at this point it definitely is, is the best thing to be doing so yeah well that's about it on the band update just explain what we're going to do throughout the rest of this video um, the next thing we're going to do is talk about these MIDI and digital uh, sort of Roland V systems as they're called and other such stuff um, and then our album review for this week is going to be Load by Metallica, which is an album that both of us have always loved, and it's kind of underrated as one of Metallica's albums, so we thought we'd uh, give that a bit of discussion today. So I'm going to start off by explaining uh, my use of MIDI in the band, and explaining why I decided to go with an electronic drum kit first, and then Dave, you're going to give your, your overview of the way you use MIDI which is slightly less um, intensively than me, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, at the start of this album, or the start of the process of uh, deciding, you know, what uh, the route I was going to go down um, for this album way back when we began a few years ago, uh, I decided that I was going to go the route of the electronic drum kit, um, recording MIDI, and then triggering samples within the computer because there's so many benefits to doing that. Um, you know, you don't need to have uh, a really good sounding live room with a drum kit in it to play. And you know, in terms of the actual noise pollution that you produce uh, playing on an electronic drum kit, it's it's far better. Well, it's part of the, it's your switch fully because he did have an electronic drum kit before, but it was kind of subsidiary to the acoustic kit. Mm. Um, and we used to use it kind of for practicing and various different not proper studios kind of things but it's one of the primary reasons that we now work in the way that we do mm. and that we we have our studio set up the way that we do because 
since him moving over to this, I've got rid of cabinets. Same with the bass, there's no cabinets. So we literally make no acoustic noise, um, apart from Brown singing. So yeah, it's, it's been a quite major change in the way we're working and it's made things a lot a lot easier, I think. Yeah, free, it frees us up, freed us up, didn't it? I mean, you know, the main difference uh, now with how I used to use it, because I used to use sounds within a drum module, which is what this is, this Roland TD20 uh, drum module. Uh, so I used to use the digital sounds that are actually within a module like this. This uses something called COSM, which is Roland's kind of... Um, Composite object sound modeling. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Which is the same thing that's used in, in, uh, in that. that. So, so basically now the difference is what I'm doing is I'm only using this as a trigger to MIDI interface and that means that the actual sounds is coming from a sample library. A sample library is uh, recorded drum hits in the studio that then are put together to build up a library. So for each drum, they go through the process of hitting the drum really quietly and then gradually louder uh, to full volume. And then those different uh, various dynamic layers are sort of assigned to different MIDI, um, uh, what is it, what would it be? 127, 0 to 127, so dynamic, dynamic levels within the MIDI, right? Mm. Um, well, I think the, the important thing to point out for people that don't know anything about this is that essentially what's happening is the the sounds that you're hearing are real drums recorded in a real studio with real microphones, so it's mm -hmm. not a synthesised sound. A lot of people seem, think when you're using an electronic kit, they think of something more like this, which the sounds aren't real audio, you know, they're not a real acoustic drum mm -hmm. kit or mm -hmm. anything. They're, um, they're modelled, they're synthesised to an mm -hmm. extent. Exactly, and you know, the thing is with something like this, the reason that the digital sounds you know, digitally created sounds or modelled sounds within a module like this, the reason they're so much worse really is because, you know, WAV files are big and you need a PC to run them on. We have a, a pretty monstrous PC that we run it, run uh, the software on and it's, you know, triggered by this. And a lot of people would use a module like this. This is quite a high-end module, um, you know, for the sounds within it. Uh, basically, and a good example of an album that, that uses a, a module like this in digital sounds is Construction of Light by King Crimson, mm. which I don't really like the drum sounds. I love the album, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that you know that that's uh, that's basically the difference. And the reason you know you can't get all of those sound libraries into a into a module like this. No, they're huge. These these sort of sound libraries. Um, I mean, how big is SD two? I think it's around 30 gigabytes, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, 30 gigabytes, actually maybe slightly more than oh, 30. It's more than that. I think it's like 70 or 80. It might be, it might be, some, it might be. I think actually it was Drum Kit Drum from Hell. Hell was about 30 something. Which was the one before. But anyway, it's just massive, you know, the massive libraries of sounds, because for each different drum, you need different dynamic levels, then you've got all the different microphones and bleed channels, and it's just, you know, it's there's a lot to it. Um, uh, too much to go into in this video, so so basically, you know, it's made a massive difference for me because you, what I can do is I record the MIDI uh, data live, um, playing the drum kit as I would a live drum kit, and then afterwards I can experiment with the different sounds by assigning different drums to the MIDI tracks. Um, and that that's a really important thing is the fact that he's actually he's playing these the takes live, mm -hmm. so. Um, it's not metronomic, it's not like we've programmed it and it's perfect set to a grid on the sequencer. So you've had, we've actually still got a feeling of, you know, a live player, him playing the drums, you know, mm -hmm. a human being. Yeah, so it's all slightly out of time. Yeah, it's all out of time. <laughs> Pretty much. Mm. I, I don't know, you know, might randomly hit some of the beats in time, but, you know. But it's very, very, very close. I mean, yeah. he's a very tight drummer, so uh, it's it's it's... It's pretty. It's uh, pretty. A human close. being would never be bang on metronomic like the kind of drumming you have in like electronic music, for example, mm. which is perfect. And you you feel that you know you, you feel yeah, that yeah, subtly. Totally. It's mean, kind that, of that along with dynamics is what gives expression to, to exactly player. exactly. So um, this here is actually an electronic drum uh, example of electronic drum, and the way that electronic drums work is there's a little piezo transducer in here. Uh, which is basically just uh, picking up the vibration, which is the mechanical uh, energy, and it's it's transferring it to electronic energy. Then that goes down a, a jack lead into here, um, into this module, and then that is converted into MIDI data, 
which basically contains which channel of MIDI or which drum is being hit and also the level of the of the hit. Um, so that's basically a chain. So now what I'm going to do is give you a quick look at what happens within a computer once the MIDI data is recorded. So this is a quick look uh, inside the computer um, showing my drum software which is here, the software that I use mostly and this is Superior Drummer 2. Uh, this is a MIDI note, um, this is recorded live this is actually an example of one of our tracks, the new album. Um, this here is velocity data for each of these MIDI notes. The reason there's two here in exactly the same place is because I've copied this track over to this track um, so that I can blend different sounds. Um, for instance, this is the tom uh, the uh, snare track, and down here I've got the, the MIDI data pasted, copied and pasted and time aligned. Um, which then allows me to load up a different drum on this track within here um, and then sort of blend the different sounds you know between the different snares um, giving a, a you know a more rich or, or depending on the different part uh, you know might choose different sounds for different snare drums etc. So one thing to note is that this here, where I've got the, the cursor, that's actually a, or a 16th note, that's where a 16th note lies. And you can see here that the snare drum is slightly late where I've hit there. And that's pretty much applicable. I'm very much, very zoomed in here, obviously, so it's not too bad. Um, but that, those subtle differences of, um, of being slightly late or before the beat, which can be seen throughout all of this drumming, is um, it basically adds the human kind of feel. It is just the way that I've played. Uh, sometimes it's ahead of the beat, sometimes it's behind the beat. Randomly it might be perfectly on the beat, who knows. Um, but basically, you know, this is the, the imperfections that are so important in music and that are not present when you write, when you program drumming in a quantized manner, which means that you basically, you go in and you just program the drumming absolutely on the beat. You can, you know, you can quantize it, you can just write it in on these lines, which is what happens most of the time when people use drum software. So you can see that, you know, it's quite different. It's, every beat is slightly different, which is that it's because it's been recorded live, basically. And obviously, as well as it being slightly out of time, we've also got uh, dynamic variation. So it'll record different dynamic levels for each time I hit the drum or any drum or cymbal. And that's again just another dimension of, of uh, human feel. So I'm just going to play this to show you what it looks like. So we're now going through the, um, the track. You can see all the different notes changing here. We're following it through. And they're all corresponding to hit to instruments within this uh, program here. And that will trigger sound. So each of these instruments has uh, sounds that um, are assigned to it all. Each of these instruments basically has a whole bank of sounds and I can go through and uh, try different sounds of cymbals or whatever after the fact of recording, which is not the case if you, if you record live. So one last thing I wanted to show, obviously there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot more than I can show in this really short clip, but there's a lot more going on. But I'm just going to zoom out, this is the entire track. So you can actually see you know how much information is there um, and all of these blue notes here are, are quiet notes so if I zoom in on this one this is basically a snare drum ghost note so that's recorded you can see it's slightly out of time again but again that's just human feel really um, so you can see how much is recorded not too much of it is actually in time perfectly um, you know, but again, you know, that's basically the, the human aspect of it. You can see all a lot of ghost notes going on there, which is just me kind of playing the snare drum lightly. Um, and that's it for now. So this is a quick look at one of our final projects, which we've started bouncing audio into, just to get everything collected together. Just zooming around here, these green tracks of guitar. Uh, then. Uh, all the yellow is guitar as well, so we've got quite a few guitar tracks and things going on. Then orange is drums, 
these drum tracks are um, obviously straight out of the or they're bounced versions of the audio uh, coming out of the drum software that I use. Um, so each one of these is a different microphone within that system. Um, you can see there's quite a lot. Those are all drum tracks. These are still drum tracks. And uh, I, I guess something kind of interesting to note is you can see the result of what happens when you record drum tracks uh, which are live with various different, with varying dynamic uh, hits, meaning that each hit is, um, is a different dynamic level, louder or quieter. You can see here, that's a, there is a quieter hit there um, on this track, and there's louder, and then each, even, you know, the, the kind of backbeat snare, because this is a snare track, each hit is again quieter or louder, uh, really just depending, so there's a lot of variation there, which you wouldn't see uh, if you actually just went through a process of, you know, having the same kind of velocity level throughout all of the all of the hits you'd see slight differences but not as much and also obviously the the drumming is slightly out of time in where every beat is just a, uh, you know a small amount before or behind the beat um, which is as a result of you know just the kind of again uh, just the result of playing live you know it's very rare that you get you'd hit the beat 100% exactly on um, so yeah, you can see that again in the WAVs. And now, um, I'm just going to explain the kind of non-analog side of my uh, guitars. Um, basically, I use a system by Roland called GK, which is their kind of guitar equivalent of the TD20 Tom talked about earlier. Um, but there's two different ways of using it. Um, I'm just going to grab a guitar, actually. All of my main guitars have this pickup here which is a, a GK3 um, hex pickup where each string has its own individual uh, magnet, it's a magnetic pickup, it's not a transducer like Tom's drums but you can get these systems that work using transducers but unlike a magnetic pickup which gives one signal for all the strings on this you have an, a signal for each string independently so you can process each string entirely differently if you want. Um, but the idea of this is essentially it sends out data, audio and the magnetic pickups which is then processed by another device. So coming out of the guitar is a this is the standard uh, analog audio jack like any electric guitar has and this is the 13 pin GK plug. So I've got a cable which is like these, which essentially carries all the, the strings separately as a separate signal, and the normal audio signal, and some data switching like you have controls on the guitar itself. So once the signal goes out of there, there's two different ways you can use it. Um, the one that's similar to, to Tom's is this kind of thing, which is, uh, this is a Roland VG88, and this is a Cosm modeler. So this essentially does sounds that kind of imitate guitars or different cabinets, um, but they're all shit, and I don't use any of them. <laughs> Basically, I use this thing essentially for kind of strange ambient sort of sounds, and some sort of kind of synth type sounds, but they're not synths in the way that a MIDI synth is, is done. It's kind of signal manipulation and modeling, but it works really well. There's no uh, latency at all. It's immediate um, and it does a lot of cool things, but that's quite an old uh, device there. I don't even know, maybe at least 15 years old, I think. It's a new one, isn't that? Yeah, there's, well, I'm going to get to that. Um, and then the other type, which is what I first started using, I started using this about 10 years ago. And since then, all my guitars have been GK'd up, because uh, I yeah, can't live without it, basically. But this is actually a guitar synthesizer. Um, 
so this converts the signal from the uh, the individual pickups on the uh, on the hex pickup for each string, and this converts it into MIDI data. So this is base. This is essentially what he's using that for in the drum world. It converts it to MIDI, and then you can send it to a computer and trigger a sample library in a similar sort of way, or just a VSTi soft synth. And again, this thing itself has synth sounds on it, but again, they're rubbish. Mm -hmm. Like the the thing that um, Tom and I have noticed using Roland Gear is effectively they build really really good interfaces and conversion devices, and their sounds are just rubbish. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, we, totally we use we use other things for them generally. So yeah, this is a way of getting my guitar into MIDI, and I can play strings, uh, pads, whatever, drums, uh, <laughs> saxophones, anything, any, any kind of, any sound you can think of that you've ever heard from a, from a keyboard uh, is possible from a guitar. Same with, a, same with the drum kit. Yeah, exactly. And the, uh, the, the sort of, the way I use these and always have is it's very subtle. It's something that I blend in with my actual guitar signal, which is all analog. The other side of my rig with the guitar amp and the effects, that is pure analog all the way through. Analog valves, um, old school technology all the way. Mm. Um, and I, I use these on a separate channel into a mixer and I can kind of control the amount I have of these by the way I've written the patches. I can even control it to some extent from the guitar, um, the blend between them. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think an interesting point about about all of this is that the reason that that uh, MIDI is kind of a little bit more applicable to having a, as a main source for for what you do on the drums relative to the guitar is that you know the the ability for us to get all of the the natural uh, variations in dynamic level on the drums and the playability of those um, is easier on the drum kit because you know if you're sliding notes on the guitar for instance I mean the way that Glissando and Portmanteau are controls in 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 MIDI, and it takes a lot of work to get it lifelike on a on a guitar. It's it's a bit weird. You have to edit it, right? I mean. Yeah, you would. Well, I, I don't know. It dep It kind of depends on the sort of sound you're using. I mean, a lot of the stuff I use the MIDI stuff for is very slow, evolving pads. Um, so they have really long attack times, long release times. It doesn't work so well if you try and play like a piano sound. It's there's quite a lot of inherent latency in the system so if you're playing anything over about 80 or 90 bpm which a lot of our stuff is way over that um it kind of it, it it's a bit bit late it's not it's not good enough to use live at least i wonder what your latency the figures are in relation to mine because i mean the main reason that i went with this device even though i'm not using the sounds within it it's quite a uh, expensive device is because of the the low latency of the conversion. Yeah, it's, it's a lot longer because of what's actually happening because with the GK system the pickup is picking up a magnetic signal just like a normal guitar pickup it's just each string is independent so you've got six signals um, and what actually has to happen is software inside these devices or in, in the, um, the GR33 the synth one actually has to recognise the pitch recognise the dynamics and then convert it into MIDI so it's a Oh, yeah. got a lot to do mm. um, so there's there's always been and I think there pretty much always will be you know, a mm. fair amount of latency in, in doing that whereas this, the V system with the Cosm modelling is, is different it doesn't have those it doesn't have to do that step effectively it combines a sound with your original sound and kind of models a new sound from it mm. um, so that, that's instantaneous whereas that has delay yeah, I mean, I did a calculation on my latency within the system that we use because we've got high-end PCIe sound cards, um, which we can set to a very low buffer uh, setting. And my calculation was that it took around the same amount of time for me to hear the sound when I hit the snare drum uh, using electronic triggering and all of the conversion that's going on and sample triggering. It's about the same amount of time as it would take for the sound to go from the drum to your ear. So um, it's like two two point something milliseconds. It's yeah, really three milliseconds, which is stupidly fast. Whereas I think the 
the latency in, in that I really don't even know. It's five it's or probably, six. It's when you oh, get it's up. More than that. It's when you get up around that level that you start. You can you, you can, can feel, feel it. Feel it. Time, yeah. 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 You can feel it's late. Um, just one final thing I wanted to just show on the guitar front. If you could take that mic, so I can show this. This is the guitar I showed earlier, which is my J Custom, and as you can see here, the uh, the the pickup is mounted directly to the body. This is a control for for that, as long along with these and this. It's actually installed in the guitar permanently, and it was done like this from the factory. This is the J Custom. This is the first um, guitar. This was like Ibanez's prototyping for um, for using the uh, the Roland system. Um, I, they made these. They made about twelve of these in two thousand and one. And the and the uh, the J Customs are basically the best guitars Ibanez make. Their uh, their master luthiers make them, and they're generally like prototypes. They take them to uh, uh, like Nam, the uh, music mess, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just to show off new designs, new technology, uh, etc. So this was the first time they'd ever incorporated this system. You can see there's a. Uh, Quite a large plate there for all the electronics in the back of it. Uh, lovely through neck as well. But um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an awesome guitar. But yeah, and after that, they actually introduced a a GK uh, model into their line, and to this day, they still they still make them. Um, the other way you can do it is the way I've done it with my Les Paul. Um, and I've got another Les Paul, and I've done the same thing. This is. Uh, a completely impermanent solution. It's mounted to the guitar, and you can just take it off whenever you want. And it, it mounts to the um, uh, the the, uh, the bridge there. Got a bit of rust going on there. Well, this it? has been on here for about ten years. Yeah, it's getting pretty mashed up. <laughs> but yeah, it fits into the way we work because we we like using new technologies and using everything that there is available really to get different sounds and expand your palette um, like the way I work with the guitar being having those two separate signals and they're being mixed together I also use loopers and stuff so I can build a huge amount of sound for just one guitar you know and it's um, I'm talking live here not not just on albums you know I can layer stuff up uh, which is really cool. It just opens up loads of creative uh, avenues to explore. Mm -hmm. I guess one last little thing that I can mention is, you know, again going back to the Roland TD20 um, interface. It's the it. What's so great about that and the way that Roland works in terms of drums? Because we've got Roland, a lot of Roland going on here, and that's basically the reason that you mentioned earlier. But um, specifically in relation to this, you know, you can go in and you can you can change the way that the the trigger responds to how you're playing so you can set thresholds for re-triggering and you can do uh, a lot of different stuff with the curve to uh, to basically determine what data comes out of that and goes into the into the computer um, but I think that's it for MIDI for me yeah yeah we I mean yeah I, the, the main reason we kind of want to talk about it a little bit we haven't gone into any great detail there at all we'd never intended to we just kind of want us to give an overview of what we use and why and kind of what it does, its limitations and its its pros and cons kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is really because so many people sort of think that it's... Uh, artificial. Artificial or fake. Cheating. Well, I don't know, not so much cheating. Well, well, maybe I mean, with the drums, possibly, people yeah. think that. They think it's... Um, they think it's like quantized, programmed. Yeah, 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 exactly. But yeah, it's just, um, it's very convenient. It opens up a whole new way of working all these different sounds like for a guitar player you know I, I, I have access now to all these sounds that synthesizer players have which is you know that's cool I love making weird noises and stuff with my guitar so <laughs> that's mm. all good mm -hmm. yeah okay um, so I, I guess the, yeah the main the main point really is that uh, actually for drumming MIDI it captures all of the, the, the detail I mean, it captures all of the low ghost notes and all of the stuff that, that's going on, the modern systems that we have. And also, it's a, it's a continually progressing realm, and I, I like that. I like the way that it's constantly evolving, and there's so much more, you know, yeah, there's there's so much you can do with it. Sample libraries coming about, and actually, interesting anecdote, um, Daniel Bergstrand, who will be mixing our <coughs> album, was actually involved in 
creating some of the sample libraries for Superior Drummer 2 for Toon Tracks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he actually recorded the, the set of sounds, you know, thousands and thousands yeah. and thousands of drum hits with um, the drummer from Meshuggah. Yes, Thomas Harker. And that's that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because he's actually recorded those sounds that he'll then be mixing you know, yeah. later on. I mean, obviously, there's I've got a lot of sounds from from other uh, libraries within Superior Drummer too, but uh, but a lot of the sounds he actually recorded them, and now he's going to be mixing. It's kind of a weird thing, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully uh, the results will be be very good. I think they will because it sounds good already, doesn't it? Well, was Meshug is. Um Catch thirty three wasn't it that was recorded entirely yeah. using Superior Drummer the first version of. I don't know. Yeah, it was Drum Kit from Hell, I think. Yeah, Drum Kit from Hell too, I think. I don't know exactly which one. Sorry, I don't know which one it was actually. But, yeah. To be honest. But that's all. Uh, <coughs> yeah, all done from that sample library. Mhm. Mm all right, so that's it for MIDI, isn't it? Mhm. Mm all right. The album we're going to talk about on this um, video blog is, oh, I'll pick up the vinyl because it's bigger, you might be able to see it easier, um, Metallica's Load, which was 96, is that right? 96. 96, yep. yeah. Um, yeah, they, they did this album and then a year or so later they released Reload, but they recorded both of them at the same time. Uh, and it was mm. Metallica's first real... Um, shift, I suppose, in their sound away from thrash. Yeah, but I think that. Well, okay. So a couple of other things before we go into that, because that's quite a lot, quite a, the main thing that that I think we should discuss about this album. But um, you know, this is their sixth studio album. This came after what's called the Black Album, which is actually an unnamed album. Well, it's self-titled. Metallica, Metallica. Metallica. Called, called Metallica, really. Um, but uh, yeah, people call it the Black Album. Um, so this one came after that, and it was five years after the Black Album. Uh, again, it was recorded with producer Bob Rock, who in my opinion is quite a genius. Mm. Uh, works very well with Metallica, almost kind of seems like a member of the band at times. Um, I it, think, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, I remember at the time a lot of the kind of backlash they had was due to their image, like they all cut their hair. <laughs> <laughs> and they all they're all dressing up kind of I don't know what like little divas or something, and there's a brilliant picture in here somewhere of Lars with a f furry fluffy sheep jumper. Nice, typical. I don't know where it is, it's, it's funny though. But yeah, they got a lot of the um, a lot of the kind of metal people had a uh, had a freak out about the way they looked, which is kind of irrelevant really in the scheme of things. Yeah, true. Uh, that's interesting, actually. I didn't really consider that too much. Um, so just to, to finish off with the technical details of this album, um, yeah, it was recorded over 12 months. So they were actually in the studio. Mm. I think it was called Plant Studios for 12 months with Bob Rock. And that was that was after um, after 30 demos had been created by Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield, the singer and the drummer from the band. Uh, you probably already know that. Um <laughs> So yeah, they created these demos, they went into the studio and they, they basically just, you know, sorted the album out over a whole year, 12 months in the studio. I mean, that's well, they, crazy, really. I spent longer than that with the Black Album, it was about a year and a half. Really? In yeah. the studio? Well, in various studios, they went to a few, I think. Oh yeah, they did go to a few, there's one main one, which I don't know, but anyway. Um, so yeah, I think that, it's kind of interesting because I've always loved this album. Oh, hang on, I found, uh, I found Lars's Fluffy Jumper. Fluffy coat. This is brilliant. Great. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I could. I oh, could. No, I can't. I'm, it's all backwards here. Here. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other there side. There we go. Yeah. 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 Let me have a look at that. He does look like a complete twit. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, fine. So they had a bit of an image crisis. Um, but you know. In terms of the album, I, I've always loved the sound of it. I always loved the album right from when it was launched. and uh, I can kind of understand and kind of appreciate why the Metalheads and the Metallica fans from, you know, who really started with uh, Kill 'Em All and way back at the beginning of, of uh, Metallica's career went through the whole process of their various different albums. Um, you know, this is, I can see why this would be the point at which they would go, well, this has really got too too much. Well, now. it wasn't what they expected, I suppose. 
you know, they, they expected another, you know, ride the lightning or master of puppets and it's nothing like it. Yeah, but the thing is you can feel that because it's really blues elements in turn, we'll talk about the music part of it more than the, the image, just forget about that. But, um, but basically, you know, in terms of the, the, the music, I think that you could really hear that already on the Black Album. I think yeah, you could, yeah, well, uh, it's was, it was much more simplified, um, mm. more kind of riff-based in, in terms of riffs that cover the whole song as opposed to lots and lots and lots of changing parts and stuff. Mm. Um, it's much simpler, kind of more solid in a way. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and this is really where, I mean, really the Black Album, but also this album is where Lars Ulrich really honed his, uh, his, his backbeat which is just uh, kick, snare, you know, uh, and simple, uh, that simple kind of playing. But in terms of, you know, the sound of this album, you know, it is, it is, um, from, in my opinion, it, it just, it, I think it really is a great uh, example of, of Metallica and who, who they are. And also, you, you know, you can see the kind of evolution up to this album. But for me, this really is like a, where they kind of really glued everything together, the blues elements, the songwriting, mm -hmm. you know, the, the heaviness, the sound of it, where it all kind of came together. Interesting, they don't really feel that that much with Reload. I feel that a lot more with Load mm. um, and the Black Album. And I'm sure a lot of Metallica fans would, would very much disagree with me on pretty much everything I've just said. But um, in my opinion, you know, I think that this is where they their sound was just so... Uh, nicely well rounded in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. uh, and and also heavy and since that point they've really been almost trying to do something they're trying to recreate something or trying to you know go back to their to their really early days and yeah. it, it seems a bit artificial after this point to me this album uh, these albums load and reload really low it doesn't really feel like it's forced it feels like it's actually them what they wanted to be doing yeah, yeah, yeah yeah, who knows? I mean, for the record, I guess that this is one of my all-time two favourite Metallica albums. It's really this one and the Black Album that that I like the most. The Master of Puppets for me is probably mm -hmm. my favourite overall. But yeah, um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's there's great tracks on here. It's, it's a lot more catchy and poppy, I suppose, and mm. more song-based. You know, more traditional songs. But yeah, like. The house that Jack built until it sleeps, King Nothing, Hero of the Day, they're all awesome songs. Mm. Um, the Outlaw Torn is one of my favourite Metallica songs, actually, I absolutely love that song. The um, the version on SNM. Yes, exactly. Well, awesome. that's the full version. Hmm? You know, for that track, what they did was they, they had to, for the album, they got up to 78 minutes, 59, mm. and the, the record label said to them, you can't have the full, you know, you can't have any more time, and, and they had to cut 30 seconds from the album, so they cut the extended version of, oh, of, okay, of Outlaw. The track's actually called Outlaw, and Outlaw Torn is just because they, they removed that, that kind of jam bit at the end of the, of the track to fit it onto a CD. Hmm. Um, and then, I think they released the full version, I guess it's the version you were, you were talking about. Well, and that's a lot of the live one they did with the orchestra. Not sure if they ever released the full studio version, but I'm pretty sure they did. Um, yeah, I mean, influential band for us, and well, very influential band uh, for us. You know, we've been fans of Metallica for a very long time, haven't we? Oh yeah, since before we met each other. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, long time. Probably, I've been a fan of theirs from just before the time that this album came out. Ninety five, I guess. Mm -hmm. Ninety five, yeah, ninety six. Some gr there's a great video for I think it's Until It Sleeps mm. which I remember very distinctly mm. uh, back when MTV was all you know was a lot more important um, yeah. yeah so I think that's about it for it really awesome album I'm sure you know it but um, if you don't know it you should definitely listen to it and another thing that's quite interesting as well I think our GoPro has died it yeah. has yeah. yeah um but the, the cover art, I can't remember the artist that did it, I'm not going to look it up, I'm sure I could in the in the album. But um, this is kind of partly why the album's called Load, or the, why they chose the artwork at least. It's actually the artist Blood and Seaman. 
that he mixed up and fired down a tube against a pane of glass and it's been photographed as it hits. But it kind of looks like fire, but it's when you see it from a distance initially you think it's fire and then you look at it and it's oh, actually yeah. uh, it's actually blood and semen. Well thanks, I didn't actually know that, <laughs> but now uh, yeah, I can see that. Mm, interesting. <laughs> I think that that's a good place to end with, yeah. uh, with that album discussion. Right, so that's about it for uh, this video blog. Um, Brown sent us a, a video from, from Rome, so we will put this in now. Hello, it's Brown here from the Ritual Fire of Celebration to wish you an epic new year rocking with Isarus. So keep rocking throughout ages to come. See you later. Goodbye. You fucking burns. Happy New Year, my Fucking, fucking burns. <laughs> Thanks again, uh, Brown, for a little video from Rome. Um, looking forward to your return and uh, inclusion in the next Isra's video blog. Uh, that's it for today. Um, so, uh, yeah, Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, and we're in the final month of this album. And then, within a month or six weeks or so, it'll actually be out. Wow. Yeah, can't wait. Honestly, I can't wait. Uh, so thanks for watching, and tune in to the next Isra's video blog. Uh, hopefully, which will be delivered in around a week or two weeks' time. <laughs>